distinguished guests, Minister for Education in Sweden, Mats Persson, uh, Director uh, at the Research and Innovation Directorate at the European Commission, Anna Panagopoulou, ESS staff, partners, collaborators, and all friends joining us online. You're very, very welcome to this celebration at the European Spallation Source this afternoon. My name is Sindra Peterson Orfeld. I'm Senior Science Advisor here at ESS, and I am going to uh, take us through this celebratory ceremony this afternoon. We have some really interesting speakers lined up. And after the talks, the people in this room will get to go out on a site tour to see some of the developments that have been made. Uh, and then there will be a reception afterwards here back uh, in the office building. The road to science at ESS is a long one, and uh, there are many challenges, but also many small victories. And it's really important to celebrate the achievements that we make along the way and the milestones that we hit. Uh, building tomorrow's facility for science using neutrons for the future researchers, uh, perhaps the most difficult thing in doing this is actually generating the neutrons themselves that we need. This being a spallation source, we're going to generate neutrons using a large and powerful accelerator and a target system. And this is a very large part of the ESS project, and a number of achievements have been made this past year, and that's what we're here to celebrate. These things include a commissioning of what we call the normal conducting part of the linear accelerator, or LINAC, uh, the cryo distribution system, and also the readiness of the core of the facility, the target building for installation of the very key components that will produce neutrons for Europe in the future. Uh, I would like uh, to present our first speaker today. It's the Director General for the European Spallation Source. Please welcome Professor Helmut Schober. Thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure for me to have you all here, and particularly also have so many members of the ESS staff. Building the ESS is an endeavor that takes many actors, and therefore I'm really happy that the Lund Commune, the university, representative from the industry, and all the European actors, whether it's S3, the European Commission, and already uh, a lot of members of our council that came today are present here for this uh, celebration. Uh, it's a large-scale multilateral facility, so you'll need to see a lot of flags on this uh, uh, slide. Uh, but uh, I would like to stress here, and I will do it again, uh, that uh, Sweden and Denmark at the host states have taken on an enormous responsibility for hosting a facility that at the end of the day will cost uh, probably a little bit more than 3 billion euros. Right? And I always expressed that in the past, the neutron community, the whole scientific, science community out there in Europe is grateful for the two host nations uh, that they have done that, and actually also for the member states that they have joined the adventure and provided the necessary funding. Now, if from this talk you should take home one slide, then it would be this one. And it was a little bit inspired by what uh, various actors, including the minister, uh, Eric, uh, Vice Chancellor of Lund University, have said to the, at the introduction uh, to the conference that was such a big success just over the last two uh, days. And it made me reflect about the word sustainability, uh, because it implies something. If you want that something is sustainable, you really must cherish what you have, right? And I think what we have achieved in the past here in Europe uh, is building a society that places human dignity and human welfare at center stage for all aspects of life. And when we fight back certain attacks that uh, we receive on this value system, I think we learned that over the last years, uh, how important that is to protect that. So, sustainability is to preserve what we have achieved and to develop it further, because we also know it still has a couple of 
shortcomings. And if you want to do that in a competitive world, you need skills and you need dedication. And I think it was Eric who has said we have to up our game still further uh, here in Europe uh, to protect what we cherish. And this is what the ESS and, in part, and its partners are all engaged about. We want to build uh, a world-leading research infrastructure using the latest technology at the highest level of complexity and sophistication. But the story doesn't end there. At the end of the day, we have to exploit this infrastructure for 40, 50 years. And also there, we want to show that Europe is outstanding. And for that, I will need the contribution of the research that takes place uh, in the industry and at the universities, because we offer the tools, but all the important questions have to be brought to us, and then we have to provide the answers. So this is all about securing sovereignty for Europe in technology, science, for the benefit of our societies. So to do so, uh, we have support from 13 member countries, and that covers, with a few exceptions, all the countries that have a major stake in neutron scattering in Europe. And as I said already in the beginning, I'm really grateful for the sustained uh, an important support that we get from these countries. And it's not only about finance, because uh, we wouldn't be possible here in Lund, in splendid isolation, to build that facility without uh, the technological know-how, the industrial know-how that is out there in the member countries. So we do that with uh, over 100 institutions and uh, form 14 uh, countries. And the little dots that you see here indicate some of our main contributors. So it's a common European endeavor, and it is uh, both from the funding side and also from uh, the technology side. Now, this is the second time I will thank uh, Sweden and Denmark particularly, because this shows the enormous contribution to the funding that they have provided at host states, close to 50% of the construction costs, and the rest uh, shouldered uh, by the member states, and that thanking Sweden naturally doesn't mean that I don't thank the others uh, as well and uh, with the same uh, emphasis. We are on Eric, and I put this slide in because we have here are now from the European Commission, and this is a very direct link that we have uh, with the European Commission. Uh, we are very happy about that framework. We are a, a single site in the sense we have actually an office in Denmark, uh, but apart from that, we are a single site uh, Eric. Uh, we are one of the earliest. Uh, Eric's, and uh, we profit from that status. But we also, I have to say, have some ideas, and you mentioned, I think, just an hour ago, that you will open up again the discussion how we can improve the Eric regulation. We have some ideas of our own from our experience how, we, how, how this could be done, and we would be happy uh, to contribute to this effort. Uh, and we, we acknowledge the support financially. Uh, we had, via the framework programs, uh, really uh, great financial support. For us, this was important because it allowed us to stay in contact with our communities, with the other facilities, to do network uh, building. So it had a very big leveraging uh, power, and uh, we are really grateful for that. So now, what is the ESS? Sindra has hinted at that, and I'm not going to go uh, into a lot of technical details. Uh, but we shoot neutrons at matter, and when the neutrons are deviated and change direction and change energy, they contain information about the structure and, uh, and the processes going on in the material. And uh, you can imagine if you shoot uh, uh, 10 billion neutrons per second onto a sample, you get a lot of information. And with sophisticated computational techniques, we retrieve that information from uh, these scattered neutrons. Now, how do we get those uh, neutrons? Um, well, uh, all of us uh, to 40% are constituted of neutrons. So neutrons are actually not a rare particle in the universe, right? 
The problem is that neutrons like protons, and this is the process of fusion that drives the sun and that brings all the energy to the Earth. Uh, so we have to invert that. We have to get the neutrons away from the protons. And the process we use is a process called spallation. It has the added advantage that we can pulse it, and this, uh, without going into the detail, makes uh, our experiments uh, very efficient. So we need those protons at very high energy so that they can dump a lot of energy into the nucleus and evaporate the neutrons. That's why we're building the world's most powerful proton accelerator. And it has, uh, as Sindra has said, a warm pod or a normal conducting pod. And this pod is commissioned uh, at, the mo at the moment. And then we have a long superconducting pod. At the end, the protons will be, have energies very, uh, will have uh, speeds very close to the speed of light. And so they are produced by the target that Sindra has also uh, mentioned. This is a sophisticated uh, device because as we use such high power beams, uh, they have a serious impact on the material. Uh, we use a wheel so that this impact is distributed over a larger volume. Uh, and then we have to cool and slow down and uh, the target will become radioactive and we have to deal with that. So we need also enormous competences here at the ESS for that machine. And uh, in the context of the conference I mentioned that this morning, I would just underline the digital aspect of uh, what we are doing here. Everything is connected. And uh, Henrik, the head of uh, ICS, Integrated Control Systems, expects that at the end of the day we have more than 10 million sensors and variables out there that will collect continuously data and we naturally would like to use the most recent technologies like artificial uh, machine learning uh, to make uh, boost the uh, <coughs> availability of our accelerator. So that in a nutshell, and you see we do lots of instruments at the end, uh, that is to provide uh, science uh, over all natural uh, sciences, engineering processes. Uh, and so this suite of instruments is dedicated to these various uh, communities. And uh, so we will have structural biologists, we have engineers, we have fundamental physicists, and you name it. So where are we today? And this is a strong promise uh, that we make now since uh, two years, since we have uh, digested uh, the effects of COVID and go, gone into the rebaselining. We want to see users here at the end of 27 are uh, going into the scientific program in 28. Uh, on this way, uh, we have an important milestone, which is uh, beam on target, and that is foreseen at the moment for 25. Uh, uh, and it uh, has still some contingency, so the later date would be beginning of 26. So that's our commitment. It's a strong commitment, and we will live up uh, to this. And that you see here, uh, equipment is uh, uh, put into operation. Uh, so this is cryo modules. Uh, you see uh, a couple of logos here. So this uh, is uh, contributions, for example, from uh, France. Uh, but also Italy, uh, the UK, and just to give you an impression, we will see movies later on. This is where the action of the spallation happens. Without going into the detail, you will have the target wheel down there, the nice, sh uh, bright, shining structures uh, is shielding against radiation that we have to cool to get uh, some of the heat out. Uh, and that naturally has to be built for 40, 50 years of operations and therefore meet the corresponding quality criteria. This is neutron extraction systems that where the neutron beams will go out to the instruments. Here you see instruments being constructed. So our mission uh, is very broad. I would like to stress that in the picture I drew from, of our societies where we place the human being, its dignity at the center stage, fundamental questions that knowing the, universe, uh, the origin of the universe uh, are as important as other societal challenges. So we will give proper attention to these fundamental things. Fundamental research in many other areas is preparing the technologies of the decades to come. But we also would like to be present when it comes to the technologies of tomorrow. So uh, this is just an example uh, that was taken by our friends at SNS. Uh, it's uh, a SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, protein 
that cuts polypeptide chains. And if you want to uh, develop medication, uh, then uh, you can block that protein action and the, your disease will be cured. Uh, medication like that exists, for example, for the AIDS virus, and we try to develop the same for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this is complementary to the X-ray data that have been taken. So here I would also like to stress that the fact that uh, here on Brunkzirk we have uh, MOX4 and the ESS together uh, is a great added value, and we will do everything uh, to get these synergies uh, uh, to the benefit of our users. So, we're keeping Euromutron Cyan competitive on a global level. You see that there is a lot of neutron facilities all over the world. There's billions of euros invested in other continents. And it's an area where Europe has the lead since uh, decades, and it is our obligation to make sure that with the ESS uh, we remain leaking. But we don't do that in splendid isolation. We don't do it alone. Our strength of European neutron science was always that it was featuring a suite of very potent uh, facilities combined with an extremely dynamic and always renewing uh, user community. And the ESS will fully integrate, that is my promise, into this ecosystem, offering unique capabilities and added capacity uh, for the European uh, research area. So my last slide, somebody said that maybe it's the most difficult to bring the protons on the target. That's not my conviction. I think uh, the most difficult is that once we have finalized this project successfully, and we are the world's most, the brightest neutron source, we have to make sure together collectively in the European ecosystem with the universities, with the industrial research labs, that will produce the added value that we have promised, and that for decades to come. And that's where I also need your support. That is the national funders, the European Commission, everybody, uh, and you see it's a long-term engagement that uh, we need. So thank you very much for what you have done in the past and looking forward to this adventure, to continuing this adventure with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helmut. I'm sure there are questions, and I would ask you to remember your questions and bring them on the site tour. You'll have very knowledgeable guides to talk to, and also at the reception. Uh, we would now like to uh, look a little bit closer at the accelerator part of the project. And uh, to walk us through it, we have uh, accelerator, uh, accelerator engineer Cecilia Maiano. Please welcome Cecilia. Hi. <clears throat> Um, good afternoon to everybody. My name is Cecilia, I, and I joined ESS in 2017. I work in the accelerator division and as a SRF, superconducting RF physicist. I will give you now a high-level overview of the accelerator over the video. Okay, we celebrate today some of the milestones reached by ESS on its road to science. Let's remind, uh, in 2018, we had the inauguration of the ion source. Then in 2021, we had the first beam commissioning from the ion source to the first DTL, uh, which is Drift Tube Linux. And then uh, currently under uh, 2023, we are doing the beam commissioning to the fourth TDL tank. So ESS, as mentioned, is an accelerator-driven neutron source. So the accelerator has a critical role in the facility. The functionality is straightforward. It, uh, protons are produced at the ion source, they are accelerated and steered along the LINAC, and then they reach a target where the neutrons are produced via the spallation process. Uh, in the video, you will see the block diagram of the accelerator with uh, each subcomponent. And as I mentioned, protons are produced at the ion source. Then they go through the low energy beam transfer section. They reach a radio frequency quadrupole where they have the bunching and the first acceleration. Then again, with magnets, they go through the medium uh, energy uh, transport section and they reach the DTL. 
the beam leaves the normal conducting linac that operates at room temperature and enters directly the superconducting linac. In this section, the acceleration is provided by superconducting cavities made of niobium. Those cavities are immersed in liquid helium at 2 Kelvin, which is minus 271 Celsius, provided by our large cryo cryoplant. We have three families of uh, uh, cryomodules hosting cavities in the superconducting linux, just to mention double spoke, then medium and high beta uh, energy elliptical cavities, where beta is the ratio of the proton to the speed of light. After the superconducting linux, the beam is transported through the high energy beam transport to the target. Target. All the subsystems in the accelerator need to work together. The power to the beam is given through the radio frequency distribution system, which converts the AC uh, electrical power to radio frequency power needed by each uh, subcomponent. The knowledge of the position and the shape of the beam is crucial in the machine, and ESS is and will be provided with many uh, beam instrumentation. All operations are driven and monitored through the main control room, where we have, of course, shift leaders, operators, and beam physics experts. And just to conclude, uh, yes, uh, we are building the most powerful accelerator-driven neutron source, and our scope is to study the structure and the behavior of matter at a very tiny level. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Cecilia. Fantastic work. There will be a quiz on this material at the reception. <laughs> uh, I'm so um, pleased to introduce our next speaker from the European Commission, the Directorate General of uh, Research and Innovation. Please welcome Director Anna Panagopoulou. Uh, dear Minister, Dear Helmut, Director General of ESS, ESSS, dear colleagues, friends, partners, with whom we have been working together in the European research area the last four, five years, four years, I think, since I took over, three years since I took over. Dear ESSS staff, you are the most important around this table, I think. Today, we are here to celebrate ESS developments. But I think even more, I feel that today here we are to celebrate Europe. Because the ESS, what I see here today, is a great example of how Europeans and beyond Europe, we can collaborate all together to achieve great science, to accelerate developments, not just neutrons and protons, we accelerate developments as well in Europe, and to promote technological leadership for Europe and sovereignty for Europe. So thank you for this. Thank you to the Swedish presidencies for organizing these fantastic events, discussing about research infrastructures and digital transformation. And I think what we are going to see today is an illustration of what we have been discussing for the last two years, two days, sorry. And in addition to that, I feel that ESS is another important model of Europe, where different uh, actors have contributed to the financing of this uh, infrastructure. So we, European Commission, very tiny, because uh, of course our research infrastructure program, uh, for the moment at least, uh, allow us to contribute with design studies, preparatory studies, and transnational access. So I have calculated, but maybe I'm wrong, around 31 million euros over the last year, contribution to ESS infrastructure. Uh, Christoph uh, Kuhn from EIB, I think you put 200 million euros as a loan to the infrastructures as well. And of course, m most more important is the member states. Sweden, Denmark, but all the others within kind contributions. And I found this is particularly interesting model that has been developed in the context of ERIC because we have a unique installation or two installations, split it. But then uh, what you need here is produced across Europe. 
And I think this is a very interesting and unique model, which again signifies that Europe works together, and the scientists of Europe and the industry of Europe works together to deliver what we have today. So, well done. And you mentioned that there are some delays, indeed. But I think for such a challenging project that aims to be the project across the world is justified. So again there, we have to work all together. No, it's not justified. Sorry, you forget me. It's not justified. Well, I have to say justified. Huh? I cannot be the bad one here. So, but let's say that we should work all together, all together, to accelerate the developments. Um, we, from the European Commission side, we always seen a little bit as the money. So the program comes here to finance. But I would like today not to speak to you about the program. Of course, there will be continuation of the program and we'll see the future. I would like to speak to you about what we are doing from the research policy point of view, together with the member states, in order to enable strategies and to prioritize research infrastructures that we could finance all together. And the first and most important issue that I would like to talk to you today is about the future of the European talents first. So we do need this type of infrastructures in order to train our talents and to keep our talents in Europe, but also to bring talents from outside Europe. Because we are in a world where we are losing what the people that, to whom we have invested through education. So facilities like that in Europe will help us to retain talents and to bring the best talents in Europe. I can say a little bit about myself. I studied, I wanted to study always physics, but at the end I studied electrical engineering. And after some years in the private sector, I had to move to policy making. So I never had the opportunity, and I say it sincerely that, uh, to be offered a position in such a place. So I think nowadays we have to look at the careers of our scientists, researchers, young people in a completely different way. We need to give them the opportunity to think about different perspectives and different possibilities for their careers. What I like very much being here is what I read about the region as well. So there is one place here in Lund. We have uh, the data center in uh, Denmark, Copenhagen, is it? Then there is a photon installation, Max 4, here as well. And you have industrial partners with whom you are collaborating. Do you know how we call this now in the European Commission? A regional innovation valley. So it's a European regional innovation valley. And because we want to promote this type of collaboration in a region, but also between regions, we have recently called, uh, launched a new call that I would really like to ask you to, to visit and look at it, where we would like to promote this model. Regions across Europe to work together together with universities, with the research infrastructures, with the industry, on concrete deliverables for the society and for deep tech technologies. And you saw that. You are working on that. So you are also an example of what we want to achieve through regional innovation valleys. Last but not least, for two days, we are talking about digitalization of research infrastructures. And you demonstrate with your example that you have a plethora of data that you are going to, or you generate already, through neutrons in order to do your experiments. And then this plethora of data, they need computation. And you could be a, an excellent example of EOSC as well, the European Open Science Cloud, by organizing this data fair and by sharing this data with the others that they will benefit from that. So overall, you are a live example of European research area, I believe. And I would like to, to conclude uh, my intervention by saying that there are still a lot of challenges. You spoke about the operation 
of the infrastructures. This is something that we do need to consider for the future. Is our funding model appropriate? Do we have to find different ways to finance these very costly and expensive infrastructures? Do we need to think again whether this model is a good model of everybody benefit across Europe without needing to have many different if similar infrastructures, smaller infrastructure across Europe? Is it the right model? These are things that we have to reflect in the context of the ESRI, in the context of the ERIC, in the context of the European Commission and beyond. And last, what we do here today is for the future of Europe, is for the future of these people here. And I would like to thank you and to invite you to work together with all of us to deliver the future of European research area. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna, for those very inspirational and visionary words. Our next speaker is from the Swedish government. Uh, please uh, welcome our Minister for Education, Mats Persson. Distinguished guests, thank you for inviting me here. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it's an honor to be here. Uh, from the Swedish perspective, uh, as uh, being um, one of the host states, this is a big day. It's a big day for all of the people working here, but I also think it's a big day where we step by step now makes this infrastructure building and this facility something that we can use for real. It's a big step. I'm very, very happy from the Swedish perspective and very proud that uh, we today can show the first steps that we are not only talking, we're also doing a lot of things and that we, in a couple of years maybe, <laughs> can, can use it in, an, in, a, in, in the way it was supposed to, it was supposed to, to be, be, be done. This has been a very, very long journey and it still hasn't ended. Uh, looking back on this project, the European Spallation Source, it has been really, really long. <laughs> it started in the, in the 1990s, I think, when the IDs came up. Uh, it was a lot of uh, political hard work. Uh, I wasn't involved, but I've heard and read about it in books uh, in the, in the two in 2000. And a lot of work in the, regarding the design and the finance of the project. And of course, to start the construction in 2014 or something like that. And up to this day, it has been a really, really long journey. There is still a long journey ahead of us. Hosting a large scale facility like European Spallation Source is a major commitment. It's a major commitment, not only for Sweden, for Europe and actually for the whole, the whole world. And uh, for Sweden, this is actually the largest investments in research that has been made ever in this country. It's the largest investments ever in Sweden. And uh, so I think this, for not only for me, but for all, of, all Swedes who's paying for this, it's a, it's a big thing and it's uh, the first step, first step where we step by step are creating this big adventure. Technology. Looking back 20 years, looking back 40 years, looking back 60 years, looking back 80 years, comparing where Sweden, Europe and the world is today, compared to 20, 40, 60, 80 years back, is a dramatic change that has occurred. And you, I mean, it has been different technological developments during different periods, but there is one common thing that's always, always is the same. And it's the fact that technology will always beat politics. You can't forbid new technology. It's almost impossible. You can try it, but you will fail. So you have to, you have, you, you, you have to make a decision. Do you want to promote it, or do you want to stop it? And from the Swedish perspective, we will always promote new technology. And so technology is the driving force behind economic and societal development. It has been that from a historical perspective, but I think if you look at the issue of climate change, if you look at the issue of machine learning or, or AI, and if you look at all the, the things happening in the in life science sector, that's three examples. 
all of them can be combined in, in uh, can be combined and it's a matter of using the technology in the right way and to have the courage to invest in technology for the future. Sweden is a small country. We prefer to call ourselves we are a smart and small country. <laughs> exactly. You can always <laughs> debate about that. But we are a small and smart uh, country. And we, so we have to cooperate with other countries, with other small and smart countries, but also with some big giants close to Sweden and uh, some of them are further away. We, we can't build this kind of uh, facility by our own. We need to cooperate with other countries. And the 13 European countries that are financing this project and all the other partners, in-kind partners and different kind of partners in different ways. Uh, all of us are contributing to the future by this important facility. Research infrastructure rely on cross-border cooperation as well as cross-sector cooperation, which creates new possibilities and great ideas for the future. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it's an honor for me as a representative for the Swedish government, of the Swedish government, to be here today. It's a big step for Sweden. It's an even bigger step for Europe. And together we are going to make this become a really, really great facility that we all, all of us are going to, going to have the possibility to use. And this is the way investing in research infrastructure and promoting the new technology, that's the way how we we deal with all the societal and economical challenges that we share together. So this is the first step, it's not the last step, and this is a common journey. I'm looking forward for the coming 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 years, or whatever that will come later. And uh, this is an amazing step for me on a personal level, and this is an amazing step for the Swedish government. So thank you all, and good luck, good luck with your work. Thank you. Thank you, Mats. It's fantastic to hear and feel this enthusiasm and support both on the Swedish and the European level uh, here today. Uh, now we would like to uh, learn a little bit more about the target assembly. And uh, uh, to help us uh, walk us through that, I'd like to welcome mechanical engineer and uh, unit lead in the target division, Naya Delacour, please. <clears throat> yes, so as Sindra just introduced me, my name is Naya Delacour. I have been at ESS in 2012, so I've been here quite some time. And I'll take you through the Target Station video today. So, together with our in-kind partners, we're building the world's most powerful accelerator-based neutron source to study the structure and behavior of matter at the atomic level. Let us take a look at the latest milestones achieved for the Target Station. The target building is under the large sombrero roof. In the middle of that building, in a cylindrical structure referred to as the monolith, the actual spallation neutron source is located. When spallation occur, we will need a lot of shielding material. The inner shielding allow the protons to impact the target wheel and lead the neutrons to the instruments while shielding the surroundings from radiation. The blocks closest to the center, they're water-cooled. Media, signal, and electrical connections enter through almost 100 penetrations in the connection ring. The final shielding stands in a cylindrical shape, 6 meters high and almost 6 meters in diameter. Installing these large and heavy Lego blocks require a lot of precision, granted there is only 20 millimeters left to the vessel wall. The ESS rigging team, together with the installation team, has done a remarkable job. In the midst of all shielding, the target wheel will be inserted. The target wheel is a large disk holding almost 7,000 tungsten bricks. Tungsten is a neutron-rich material, so when it receives the proton beam and almost the speed of light, it will release neutrons in all possible directions. The helium coolant of the wheel is transported through the shaft, and the drive unit provides all functionality for the wheel, such as rotation and positioning. The neutrons scattered from the target wheel need to be cooled down and slowed down, and first then can they be steered towards the instruments. 
Inside the large support structure sits the decimeter-sized moderator vessels. The moderator is rotated into its place above the target wheel and is the heart of the facility that all instruments aim at. The target monitoring plug is positioned just above the wheel and used to measure the position of the target wheel center and its temperature. The target wheel itself has been turning in the test stand for an extensive period of time to confirm its functionality, stability and reliability. To guide the moderated neutrons out to the instruments, ESS has 15 unique instruments and one test beamline. Each neutron beam port insert looks the same on the outside, but holds customized instrument-specific copper optics inside that are surrounded by helium atmosphere. They weigh around four ton each, are three and a half meter, and need to be lifted over the shielding blocks of the bunker to be installed from the outside of the monolith. Since they are installed into a vacuum atmosphere, just like with all other components, it's important to have good cleanliness. The tolerances surrounding these components are very tight to reduce radiation streaming. For first installation, the neutron beam port inserts can be inserted without radiation protection by rolling the inserts onto kinematic mounts that ensure a good installation precision. Currently, the insert for 13 instruments and test beam lines are installed. And remaining to be installed is the target wheel with cool chilling blocks, the moderator reflector plug and related chilling blocks, the target monitoring plug, the proton beam instrumentation plug, and then the monolith vessel head can be put on, and all our years of hard work can finally be commissioned. Thank you for listening. Fantastic. Thank you, Naya. This uh, wraps up our talks, uh, and we're about to go out on a site tour. So before going out, I would like us all to thank our speakers one more time.